Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church as we gather together to worship our risen Lord and Savior on this a Sunday morning. And to our church family at home, we are just delighted to know that you're out there, that you do tune in and listen. As we gather together to worship this morning, I'd ask us to remember a few things in prayer today. Remember our pulpit committee in the process that we are searching for a pastor, that God would supply our need here and we would be found faithful, continuing to pray for that ends. But we would I would also ask you to pray especially for two churches. One, the Afghan Sturt Church, the trouble and the difficulty. The, uh, if you paid attention to the news, life is very, very tough for believers over there for anybody. But also for the Romanian church who is, um, not Romanian, Ukrainian church that is uh, anticipating the difficulty that may happen over there if Russia does decide to invade. The prayer is that they would be found faithful in the difficult times ahead. So let's look to the Lord this morning in a word of prayer. And please take a moment to pray, especially for our new pastor, as God prepares his heart to bring him here. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come here this morning with just thankfulness in our hearts. Thankfulness that you love us, that you care for us, and that you watch over us. Father, we ask you to be with our public committee as we continue the process of searching for a pastor, that you would prepare his heart to come here and to minister in your name, that this church might be grow and bring honor and glory to you in these days that you have us living here. You have called us to be a witness in this world. And Father, the only way we are witnesses is for true believers, that it is by grace through faith in Christ alone that we serve him. Father, we do pray for the world situation in Ukraine and in Afghanistan. For the believers there, Father, give them comfort and peace knowing that you are in control even though the days may seem very, very dark and very, very dim. So, Father, as we listen to the message this morning, speak to us about our need for grace to daily keep account with you that we'd examine ourselves in the light of scripture daily that we would not walk in a counsel ungodly or sit in the seat of the scornful but to rely on your grace that we might serve you in Christ's precious name we would pray Amen Karen let me get my Bible excuse me we're going to open our service this morning by singing number 201 grace that is greater than our sin Verses 1 and 4.
my next song is Amazing Grace. We're going to sing all five verses. I was telling Doris that this week I googled the 25 favorite Christian hymns. And we've sung 24 of the 25 since July, so we're right on point. <laughs> but uh, this, I looked it up on several um, listings, and Amazing Grace, top of the list, and every, I looked like five different lists, and it was the number one favorite hymn. And when we um, handed in our cards, about six people had chosen that as their favorite hymn, no surprise. So, Amazing Grace. <laughs> every week. But one thing I don't know, when the microphone's going to come and go. That's <laughs> no, one thing I don't know is who cleans the sidewalk when it snows? I suspect it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, well, thank you, though. I, sometimes we probably don't thank him for Every time I ask who's doing something, it seems like it's him, though. But he, a, a great servant of the Lord, a great thing. In our new members class this morning, one of the things we were able to do is to take a tour of the church. And I learned a lot of things about the church. And I um, appreciate Chuck taking us around. Uh, one thing I noticed, though, the dungeon, a great place for anybody that falls asleep during the message. 
So we'll just escort you down to the dungeon and you can spend the rest of the time down there. Although it is a little cold, I do have to tell you that. And I, one other question, I'm assuming that Karen chose the hymns. Um, they were spot on. Thank you. Very, very good. A lot of songs about grace. And uh, these, were, these were great songs about grace. And we're going to be looking to God's word about grace in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. I'd like to read that right now. It starts out by saying simply, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. For ten verses in Titus chapter 2, all of us of every age have been given particular instruction in Christian living. Started out with the older men, went to the older women who could teach the younger women, and then it went to the younger men, and irrespective of their age, it then went to bond servants. Doctrinal truth, principles of God's word, very practical for all of us to be looking at. Now in verse 11, the word for introduces the basis for the instructions that we've already received. A doctrinal explanation follows. It gives the reason for the ethical instructions that are in included. There's a note in the NIV study Bible, if you happen to have one of them. Right conduct must be based on right doctrine. So here's how we're supposed to act, and now here's why. Another commentary said, Christian conduct must be grounded in and motivated by Christian truth. It's the grace of God that saves us and enables us also to live the life that we're supposed to be living. Sometimes people want to do it the hard way. They want to try to do everything themselves, but we can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We can't do it by our own best intentions, our most sincere resolutions, but we can do it. We can do it, but through the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. Now that word appeared is from the Greek word ephane, from which we get the word epiphany. It means to become visible or to make an appearance. It carries the idea of grace suddenly breaking in on our moral darkness and that's who we really are. We are people who are estranged from God. We're in the dark, and he's taken us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, but that's his doing. Suddenly, God breaks in. Grace breaks in, just like the rising sun occurs. In fact, it's used of the sun in Acts 27, verse 20. It tells us the grace of God has appeared. And not only did it appear, but it gives us. That's what grace does. And it gives us, and several things are mentioned, what it has given us. First of all, salvation for all people, according to what we just read in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody is saved. There are those who use this as a proof text to teach universal salvation. They say God's a God of love, therefore he can never punish anybody. Nobody will ever be in hell. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. So please don't think because it says the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, that that means everyone is going to be saved. Very clear from the scriptures that only those who by faith receive God's gift of grace are going to be saved. So the offer of that grace is to whoever calls on the name of of the Lord Jesus. Whoever recognizes that he or she is a sinner and can't save himself or herself. 
We need a Savior, and we need to invite that Savior to forgive us of our sins. So grace has given us salvation. The offer of salvation is absolutely for everyone. But again, only those who receive his grace are going to be saved. No one is saved apart from his grace. And here we see the incarnation of the Lord Jesus. God became a human being. And that's when grace just exploded here on this earth. That's how grace first appeared. What is God's grace? It's his free favor. Undeserved by us. God takes the initiative to save us to change us, to transform us. Salvation is his gift that he offers us. Knowing this church and knowing how well you are schooled in the scriptures, this is no new acronym for anyone, uh, the acronym of grace. How many of you have seen this before? God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, a, a great way to summarize what grace is all about. God's riches at Christ's expense, given for us and shared with us. Grace has also been defined as unmerited favor. That's God's favor on each one of us. We didn't deserve it. We did nothing to merit it. It's just something that God gave to us. I'd like to illustrate grace by looking at the life of a person. The year is 1748. A trading ship departs from an island off the west coast of Africa, headed for England. It's trading in human slavery. It's something that is very, very awful, and I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with that. Aboard that vessel is a man by the name of John Newton, a seaman with a reputation for profane language and ungodly living. As he later described it, the captain of the ship would often tell me that to his grief, he had a Jonah on board. <clears throat> Excuse me. That a curse attended me wherever I went, and that all the troubles he met with in voyages were owing to his having taken me into the vessel. So John Newton was being branded another Jonah. And according to John Newton, the captain may have been right. Newton had earlier turned his back completely on God. But on this one occasion, a storm threatened to destroy the boat bearing Jonah, if you will. So too, a fierce Atlantic wind is rudely awakening John Newton. The vessel nearly broke apart. As the damaged ship drifted at sea, Newton prayed for God's mercy and put his faith in the Lord Jesus. That's how a blasphemous, disreputable seaman became by God's grace the godly penman of the words of the beloved hymn, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. He understood exactly who he was before God. John Newton is remembered for that hymn, Amazing Grace. In his later years, he often lost his memory in the pulpit, and he had to be reminded of the subject about which he had been preaching. Can you imagine that? In the middle of the message. Here's the preacher, and he's totally at a loss to even know what his topic is. Tell him what the topic is, he can get right back on it. But at that particular time, he was having difficulty. And he, this is what he said. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner, and that Jesus is a great Savior. That's what grace is all about. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. We're told in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I may have even said this before, um, um, I have memory problems in the pulpit too, but not like John Newton. Um, I, I can never remember what I've said, something here or somewhere else or some, some other place, but uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, do you realize that five times in two verses we are told that salvation is not due to anything that we can do, but it's totally of God. Look at those, verse, those two verses. For by grace we've been saved. 
Grace is unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace means that something that we have been given, not something that we have earned. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's the second way we realize that it has nothing to do with us. Faith requires nothing on our part except to believe in the one who tells us truth. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. That's the third time we're told. This is not your own doing, the fourth way. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. It's not something that we've earned. I don't know Christmas having come and gone. Did any of you open a present, maybe at a Christmas tree with your family or something along that line? Did any of you open the present and then say to somebody, how much do I owe you? Um, doesn't work that way. A gift is to be received. And it is the gift of God. And just in case we haven't gotten that yet, the fifth way, as verse 9 begins, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So the most remedial among us has got to realize, reading those two verses, how important grace is. It's by grace that we're saved. And four more times we're told that it's God's grace. It's nothing that we can do. <clears throat> A man writes this. In the spring one year, I left work early so I could have some uninterrupted study time before my final exam in the youth ministry class, class at Hannibal LaGrange College in Missouri. I've never heard of that college. Has anybody heard of that college? Well, that's where he was attending, Christian school. When I got to class, he said everybody was doing their last minute studying. The teacher came in and said he would review with us before the test. Most of his review came right from the study guide, but there were some things he was reviewing that I had never heard. When questioned about it, he said they were in the book and we were responsible for everything in the book. We couldn't argue with that. But an uncomfortable feeling must have come to those students, realizing that there was a lot that he was going to test them on that they had never really paid a whole lot of attention to. Finally, he says it was time to take the test. Leave them face down on the desk until everybody has one, and I'll tell you to start, our professor, Dr. Tom Hufty, instructed. When we turn them over, to my astonishment, Every answer on the test was filled in. My name was even written on the exam, and get this, in red ink. The bottom of the last page said, this is the end of the exam. All the answers on your test are correct. You will receive an A plus on the final exam. The reason you passed the test is because the creator of the test took it for you. All the work you did in preparation for this test did not help you get the A. You have just experienced, what do you think? Grace. grace. You have just experienced grace. Dr. Hufty then went around the room and asked each student individually, what is your grade? And they all had the same grade. Do you deserve the grade you are receiving? They would have all had to have said no. Do you deserve that that, that grade that you've been receiving. How much did all your studying for this exam help you achieve your final grade? Well, they wouldn't have had to study at all. And those who studied partway, even those who studied a lot, were not going to get that A+. Plus. Then he said this, some things you learn from lectures, some things you learn from research, but some things you can only learn from experience. You've just experienced grace. And he picked a time at random. 100 years from now, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your name will have been written down in the book, and you will have had nothing to do with writing it there. That will be the ultimate grace experience, written in red, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. What does grace give us? Grace brings us salvation. It's quite clear. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Without that grace, none of us would be saved. There would be no way. But grace gives us more. According to verses 12 through 14, grace is also going to bring us some training. 
It's going to bring us training. The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, but verse 12 says training us. It's going to train us in various aspects. The word for trains here has to do with the training of a child. It's child rearing, uh, just as we are in the Lord. Grace teaches, encourages, disciplines, disciples, educates, nurtures. It surrounds us with what we need to learn. What does it train or teach us? Teaches us, according to the text, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. The NIV says it teaches us to say no to these things. To say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Pretty simple. We're denouncing them. We're saying no to them. When temptation comes, we simply say no. We may have thought, does anybody know who that is? You're right that it's a president's wife, Nancy Reagan. We thought Nancy Reagan invented the just say no concept and slogan. That was an advertising campaign part of the United States war on drugs prevalent during the 80s and the early part of the 90s. But Nancy Reagan did not invent just say no because it's right here in Titus. Just say no. Denounce those worldly things. Denounce those passions that are lustful. Denounce the things that are good doctrine tells us are wrong. Grace has been teaching us all the time, say no. And again, say no to what? Ungodliness, worldly passions, and we know what those expressions mean. We're able to say no to what sometimes we're told we can't say no to. We're told that, no, we can't say no because it's going to get a grip on you and you can't get out of that whatever that particular sin or habit might be. With grace, we can say no because it's not our strength. It's not our power. It's the Lord's. Grace teaches us to say no, and that means we aren't helpless victims of sins. We're not helpless victims of habits or addictions or weaknesses or vices. God's grace teaches us to say no. That means we're capable of doing it. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty good news. Today we're told so many times that we are hopeless. You'll never get out of that nasty trap that has such a tenacious hold on you. Our society has produced a generation of people that think that there is no remedy for what ails them. They're incapable of ever being delivered or spared a particular compulsion. The good news is that society is wrong. But here's the bad news. The bad news is that we can forget the excuses. Stop playing the victim. Put away the resignation that you'll always be that way. You can't help it. Sometimes we blame it on mom and dad. That's the way they brought us up. Sometimes we blame it on circumstances. We blame it on a whole lot of things. But there are no excuses that are valid. We've got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We say no with God's help. Pay attention to the teaching and the nurture of God's grace. I love what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. Colossians 1.29, it says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Did you catch that? I think that is so encouraging. For this I toil, the Apostle Paul said, struggling, but with all his energy. Yes, life can have some things that are very, very tough but I can struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I don't have to do it myself because I can't do it myself. We're to say no to some things, but we're also to say yes to some other things. Three particular ways of living that we're to say yes to according to this passage that is before us. Grace is training us to live in certain ways in the here and now. First of all, we are to live self-controlled lives. Self-controlled. Haven't we heard that before in Titus? Once? Yes. Twice? Yes. Three times? Yes. Four times? Yes. This is the fifth time, and we're only in chapter two. This is the fifth time we've told, we're told to live self-controlled lives. The overseers were told particularly to be self-controlled. The older men were, the young women were through the older women. 
and the younger men. Everybody's told how important self-control is. I haven't defined it here since November 21st. So let me do so one more time at the risk of saying, oh, there we go again. I've, I've heard that before. Um, that's two months ago. You probably won't remember. Um, maybe not. Self-control, it means curbing one's desires and impulses, possessing self-mastery in thought and judgment. It's curbing. And I, I outlined it this way. It is being able to put the brakes on or shift to a lower gear when our selfish desires and appetites are stepping on the gas pedal. That would be our ungodliness and worldly passions, according to verse 12. Sometimes it means turning the ignition off completely. But here I am. I've got desires, impulses, compulsions, addiction. I may have some other things. What does it mean that I'm going to be self-controlled? I'm going to be self-controlled. It means that I may have to put the brakes onto some of these things. I may have to turn the ignition off. But I've got to stop because I've got to say no. But according to what it says here, we're to live self-controlled. That's what we're saying yes to. The self-control, not the out-of-control. And how easy it is for even the most godly person to be out of control in certain areas. But we're told here we're to live self-controlled. It means being the master of, not the slave to those worldly passions. It's not enough to just say no. We always need to replace the bad with something good. Because otherwise we leave ourselves in a vacuum. Do you remember when Jesus was talking about somebody who had a demon, the demon left, nothing changed, and seven demons came back. Uh, that's what we've got to avoid. We can't leave ourselves in a vacuum. Something worse may replace the bad we've gotten rid of if we don't replace it with something good. An example from the scriptures. As we, um, as we look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And I don't have that on the screen, but if you'll listen as I read Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but, so we've, we're getting rid of something. We're not going to be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. But I don't want to just leave that there and leave a vacuum. I want to replace that anxiety with something good. That's exactly what happens in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what's that saying? Don't be anxious about anything, but don't just leave it there. Replace that with prayer. Talking to God. That's exactly what it says in several different ways there. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Include that thanksgiving. When I'm anxious, I'm going to tell God whatever it is that's on my mind and everything I'm going to talk to him with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. I'm going to let my requests be made known to God. So we're to say yes to three ways of living. One of them is that we're to be living self-controlled lives. Secondly, we're to live upright. We also saw that in chapter 1, verse 8. From the Greek word dikaios, it means to be equitable or fair or innocent or holy. It's used 81 times in the New Testament. We're to live upright. We're to live upstanding. Thirdly, we are to live godly lives in this present age. Now contrast that with saying no to ungodliness. We're supposed to get rid of the ungodliness and we're supposed to say yes to living godly lives in this present age. Someone has coined three directions, which I think are very significant for us. Three directions to describe these three areas we are to say yes to with the proviso that we don't press the analogy too far. But three directions, one of them is inward. Inward, self-controlled, we're told. The other one is outward. We're told to be upright. As we look at each other, we see somebody, and we say, there goes an upright individual. Or third direction, upward, godly lives. Our lives are patterned after God. So we're to say yes to three ways of living. We're to live self-controlled. We're to live upright. We're to live godly lives in this present age. Inward, 
upward, or excuse me, inward, outward, and upward. What else does the grace of God give to us? Not just salvation, not just training, but it gives us hope. Gives us hope. Look where we are in this text so far, as far as past, present, future. We've renounced the sinful past already. We're living disciplined lives in the present, and we're looking eagerly for the future. The blessed hope is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the tenses of our lives are taken care of now. So let me ask you this question. Why are you so tense all the time then? All the tenses of our lives are taken care of. God's taking care. We've renounced the sinful past. We're living disciplined lives in the present. We're looking eagerly for the future. We are awaiting the blessed hope. Waiting carries with it the idea of longing, eager and certain expectations. We live in the expectation that the Lord Jesus could come back at any moment. We don't live in the dread that something's happening in the Ukraine that could give us World War III. That's not where we spend our time and energy and our emotion. We're not, we're not worried about that. We're looking forward, anticipating the fact that the Lord Jesus will be coming back. And he could be coming back very, very shortly. We have some things to do while we wait. But our main appointment is what we're looking forward to. It is our destiny. Now look at chapter thir or verses 13 and verses 14. I want to make a couple of very brief observations from them. First of all, it says it is a blessed hope, the return of the Lord Jesus. It fuels our happiness and joy. It's the hope of the rapture, not the tribulation. There are some who wonder, when will Jesus come with regard to the tribulation period? Will he come before, in the middle, after, or sometime maybe toward the end? I, I think personally, my conviction is that the Lord Jesus is coming back before the tribulation, and this is one of the reasons why I believe that. It's a blessed hope. I don't find a lot of blessing thinking that the next thing that's going to happen on God's agenda is going to be the tribulation period and all the horrors of that. That, to me, is not necessarily a blessing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 says this, And to wait for his Son from heaven, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. I don't think we're going to be here for God's wrath. One famous person has said that with regard to God's wrath, if you can convince me, this is a college professor, a Christian college, if you can convince me that the wrath of God is the tribulation period, well, then I will agree that Jesus is coming back before that. Well, if you were to take a look in the book of Revelation, it repeats over and over and over again, this is the wrath of God, the time of the wrath of God. The pure. I don't know why he said what he said, but it was obviously very, very wrong. We're waiting for God's Son from heaven, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. It is not a, we're not appointed to wrath, the Lord tells us. So we've got great hope that the Lord Jesus is coming back. Again, verses 13 and 14. What's happening here, this is certain because it's told for us in God's word. We're told here that Jesus is great. We're waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is great. Jesus is God. The deity of Jesus is seen here. Jesus gave himself for us, it says, to redeem us, to buy us out of the marketplace of sin and to set us free. He got rid of the bad, the lawlessness, the wickedness, and purified us for the good. We are Jesus' very own. We are peculiarly or uniquely His. And we are zealous for good works, eager to do good. Here we have that notion that Christians are a bunch of do-gooders. Okay, I'll take it. I don't, I don't mind that. Somebody wants to call me a do-gooder, I'm fine. Do you know if you look in Titus a little further, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 8, chapter 3, verse 14, it all tells us that we should be doing good works. Good works don't save us, and sometimes we get so hung up on the idea that we, we hate this term good works because it's an anathema to faith, but we're told that we should be living 
with good works. Just they're not going to save us. They're a result of being saved and then wanting to express our gratitude to the Lord for what he's done for us. Verse 15 kind of summarizes where we are. Titus is told by the Apostle Paul, declare these things. What are these things? It goes back to verse 1 of this chapter. All of the instructions are in view. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. God can say that because this is his authority. Let no one disregard you. So these are things you should declare or teach. Remember what goes along with child training, the discipline, the repetition, all the love, everything, but this is what we're supposed to declare or teach. And remember what goes along with child training also. It's going to take some rebuking with all authority and discipline, all those types of things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone disregard you. Don't let anyone look down on you. Don't let anyone depreciate you. This is God's word. That's where the authority comes from. These things must be very important, and they are. I'd like to close with a a story, again, about grace. This is where we came in. This is where we're going to go out, thinking about grace. Francesca Renderos, 22 years old, was working as a waitress. She was working as a waitress in Houston on an ordinary Wednesday night when she was stunned by grace. At one of her tables sat a man by the name of Doug Brown, a mortgage broker trying to attract the business of six female real estate agents. When Francesca came up to the table, Doug asked, what would be the most special tip you could get? A pair of shoes? A purse? She responded, No, I need a car. Now, imagine this poor guy, Doug Brown, trying to show off in front of these six agents that he wants to be able to have as as clients. And she says that, I need a car. Doug looked around the table at the six real estate agents and said, if you will give me your business, I will give this girl a car. The six women agreed. So he turned to Francesca and said, Okay, you get a car. Her response, sure, what do you want to drink? (laughs) I don't think she felt that he was going to do that. She didn't believe it until an hour later when a brand new silver Mitsubishi Lancer pulled up. This isn't silver on the picture, but it's a Lancer. And he gave her the keys. Francesca could hardly contain herself. Is this happening? What do I say? What do I do? Doug Brown gave her the words, you say, these keys are mine. That's grace to a certain degree. That's human with an ulterior motive. We're talking about God's grace. No ulterior motive. The motivation is his love for us. Sometimes people grow up and they don't feel loved. They may not have had a lot of love expressed to them in their family or with the the friends they tried to make and couldn't. Sometimes they were made fun of in school. What a wonderful thing to know that God is motivated to display his grace, give his grace to every one of us because of his great love for us. I hope that erases some of the pain of the past from some of who are here Some of that pain from the past where love is not expressed, where there were ulterior motives when anybody had to do something good for us. God gives and keeps on giving because he's a gracious God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that your grace appeared. All of a sudden, it was here on the earth in the incarnation of your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that this brought salvation for all who had placed their faith and trust in what the Lord Jesus did. But your grace didn't just bring us salvation, it trained us as well. It brought training so that we would know how to say no and have the power to say no and the strength coming from you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And we could live 
these self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, but not even be content to have things together presently, but to have the future to look forward to as well, expectantly waiting for that blessed hope, the appearing, another appearing, that of the glory of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, the return of the Lord Jesus, who gave himself to redeem us, to redeem us from everything that was lawless, to purify for us, for him, a people like us, dirty people, sinful people, people that were on the wrong side of things, that you've changed our lives. Thank you for that, and help us to be able, with Titus, to declare those things, to exhort and rebuke with all authority and not letting anybody disregard us. You've given us a great truth to share, and we want to share it. We want to thank you for that, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. salvation. Thank you for the blessed hope of the return of our Lord Jesus. Thank you for the privilege of being able to share that with others. Help us not to keep that good news to ourselves. Help us as we leave here to be able to point to the Lord Jesus. Point others to him. We thank you for the privilege of doing that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>